it says we're live and it says single-celled organisms live independently on their own we can find these unicellular creatures everywhere from microscopic bacteria to extreme archaea fascinating protists and even some types of fungi but what happens when cells decide to cooperate with some of them forming a protective outer layer others specializing to send signals and others carrying oxygen to everyone else now we have a multicellular organism where many cells work together to create a larger life form. I'm Science Mom. And I'm Math Dad. Today we're going to explore the incredible diversity of cellular life. Welcome everybody. We are going to start today by talking about an important question. How do you know that something is a bacteria or a plant or an animal? Well, I know bacteria are really small, but not all small things are bacteria. That's right. And we are going to explore this by sharing a quick little story about a very mischievous and sneaky bacteria that we do not like called salmonella. So this little cartoon representation of salmonella is many, many times larger than the actual salmonella bacteria. The actual salmonella bacteria is so small, you have to have a scanning electron microscope to see it. But if you do, it looks something like these pink shapes behind me. So those are some, some nice big pink shapes. You can see that it has flagella. It has these long tentacle-like things going out to help it move and it is very small. It lives inside the intestines of animals. Animals like mammals mm. or birds or reptiles. So I could get salmonella. You could get salmonella. Do, do I have salmonella right now? No, because if you did, you would be sick. Okay. When people get salmonella, it's called food poisoning or salmonellosis, and it makes them very, very sick. So salmonella is something we like to keep track of. You can get it by handling a pet, such as a turtle or a lizard. And this is why if you have pet reptiles, you always want to wash your hands after holding your reptile. And you want to make sure after you clean out their tank, um, especially if the tank has water in it, that you wash your hands really well. And if you do, the chance of getting salmonella from your reptile is not very high. But if you get salmonella, whether it be from um, a bird, like a chicken, or from a pet like a reptile, or from food that has been contaminated, it can make you very, very sick. One of the worst outbreaks of salmonella poisoning in the United States actually happened in 2009. And I'm curious if you can guess what food was contaminated in that outbreak. Chicken eggs. Chicken eggs are a common source of salmonella and that's why you should not eat raw cookie dough or things like that. It wasn't chicken eggs. Okay. Right. right now, there is a salmonella outbreak that's currently happening where there's been a recall of salami and certain meats. Mm. It was not meat. It was peanut butter. Oh, peanut butter. And here's the crazy thing about salmonella. So this little bacterium, when it is in a, a intestines of an animal, it's a wet environment that is very warm and it's growing really rapidly. It's multiplying and multiplying and making more of itself. But if it gets out of the animal where it's really dry, it can actually, kind of like a bear hibernates through the winter, this bacteria can go dormant mm. and it can live for quite a long time in a dormant state. So in this outbreak, from the human's point of view, it was terrible. You had hundreds of people that got so sick they were hospitalized, some people died, and then they found out that the company that makes the peanut butter they knew they had positive salmonella tests oh. and they sent the peanuts out anyway. People went to jail. It was a pretty horrible story that hopefully will make future food producers much more careful about avoiding similar situations. But let's think about it from the perspective of the salmonella. Well, the salmonella was probably pretty happy with this situation. So you had some bacteria that got on some peanuts. And then helpful human beings sent those peanuts all over North America. And then once the jars were opened up, the bacteria got inside to people and began to multiply and multiply. And we have a short little clip of a different bacteria called E. coli multiplying 
that shows you, kind of gives you an idea of just how fast this can happen. So we start off with just one. Oh, now it's two. Oh, three, four, five. Oh, oh. I and can't. now we're going faster and faster, and pretty soon there are going to be millions of bacteria. So when someone eats food that's contaminated with salmonella, within usually a few hours, they get very sick with terrible diarrhea and vomiting, and they can get very dehydrated. So that's an example of what we call exponential growth, where it's doubling each time. That's so it's really fast exponential growth. We get two, four, eight, 16, and even goes though, and goes. yeah, you think, oh, a couple of bacteria, what could that do? Well, it turns out that could do a lot. Yeah. Oh, sorry. There are two things I want to point out real quick. One is, should you be afraid to eat peanut butter? No. No. There is testing to make sure that food is safe, and occasionally there are outbreaks like this, but we have peanut butter in our cupboard, and I eat peanut butter all, all the time and enjoy it. Second, are all bacteria bad? Well, the way you ask that question makes me say no. No. Inside of you right now, you have other bacteria, such as lactobacillus and acidophilus. And if you have these friendly bacteria inside you, they actually help protect you from things like salmonella. Because if salmonella, just one little salmonella, not uh, hundreds, but if just one comes into an intestine and there are lots of these guys, they're gonna say, hey, get out of here, this is our space. And they might compete with it so much that then the white blood cells get rid of it before it causes a problem. So, so they're fr friendly bacteria, yes. we want them. But if salmonella comes down and there are no other bacteria to compete with it, you are more likely to have an issue. So our garden beds are like that with weeds. If you fill them up with good plants, there's not much room for the weeds to grow. That's true. So same principle. Same principle. Now, how do we know that a bacteria is a bacteria? I asked this before a class and we had a couple great suggestions from our chat. Tinley said that you should study them under microscopes and see what other things look similar to them. And Michelle said that bacteria are single-celled. And this is true. Bacteria are always single-celled, but the shape they have might be quite different. Some of them, like this MRSA, are circular bacteria. And some of them, like this one here, actually look like a big spiral. <laughs> then the shape of E. coli or salmonella, sort of that rod shape, is very common. And some have really cool back, um, flagella and different shapes. There's a lot of variety, but they all have a cell wall and those cell walls are made out of similar things. And then they are all prokaryotic. That means no nucleus, no nut, no nut, no <laughs> nucleus, and no organelles like that have membranes like mitochondria or chloroplasts. Pro Prokaryotes. They are prokaryotes, but there Oops. is something else that is prokaryotic that is not a bacteria, and that's a really fascinating family of creatures like Haloquadratum walsby. Is it like a giant cheese it? <laughs> it looks kind of like a giant cheese it, but microscopic. This is so small. These are single celled little algae animals, and this little square here. That is our haloquadratum. The name actually means the salty squares of Walsby, and they grow in super salty pools. And they are the only cell we know of that actually has a square shape. Mm. Isn't that crazy? Now, because these are single celled, you might be tempted to say, ah, these are bacteria. But uh, not that long ago, scientists were studying what they thought were bacteria, and they realized the DNA inside these cells is nothing like the DNA in bacteria. And the cell wall is made of something completely different. So they gave them a new name, and these are called archaea. Ooh, that's a good name. It is a really good name. And one cool thing about archaea, there are probably more species of archaea than there are species of animals, but we just haven't discovered them yet. They live everywhere. But we have not found a single one that causes disease in human beings. Oh, so they're kind of friendly. They are. To, to us. They tend to grow in very extreme locations, places like thermal hot springs, this green and then yellow and then orange and red colors that you see in this picture. That's from different types of archaea, these single celled prokaryotic creatures that live in very, very hot water. So, wait, is this a real photo, by the way? This is a real photo. This is a hot spring called Grand Prismatic Springs in Yellowstone National Park, and it is 
beautiful. And those colors are real. It really is that vibrant. Amazing. So I'm probably not ever going to hold any of these archaea if they only live in these crazy environments, right? Probably not. I do see a couple comments in the chat that our volume is quiet. We will see if we can look in that, but we might not be able to do anything about it right now. Um, moving on to cells that are not prokaryotic. So if you find a single celled animal and it is not prokaryotic, then it is probably a protist. This is an amoeba and you can see this cell has a crazy shape and it is much bigger and it has organelles inside it. Things like a nucleus or maybe a mitochondria. It's going to have lots of structure inside and cells that are eukaryotic we call protists and they can be single celled like algae or they can be multi-celled like kelp which is another type of algae is this seaweed that is seaweed is seaweed a plant math dad um you just said it was a protist it is a protist which it means is, it's not a plant it is not a plant Kelp is in a type of algae. It does do photosynthesis like plants do, but its cell wall is made of different things. And algae can also be single celled. There are a lot of really cool types of single celled algae. They are not plants. Not plants. Pro protists. The smallest plants are duckweed. And oh. these plants float on water. And you might look at a pond and think, oh, it's covered in algae, but this is not algae. This is actually a teeny tiny plant. Each of these little guys is a plant. It's a little leaf and most of them have tiny little roots <laughs> that hang down below that little leaf. And sometimes they will flower and make these teeny tiny flowers that you would almost need a microscope to see. They're so small. Oh, I so like it. So that is the smallest plant. This is the largest, one of the largest, the sequoia trees that grow in California. And to get an idea of how big they are, it helps to have people in the picture. These are our kids when we went on a trip there several years ago. And this tree, they hollowed it out so you can drive underneath it. That's enormous. Like, th these trees are just so much bigger than the ordinary trees. You can't wrap your minds around it. Absolutely enormous. So how do we know that these are both plants? This tree that is so big you could drive a car through it versus the duckweed that is so small that you have to have a microscope to see the flower. Is it the cells? It comes back to the cells. And I'm seeing some good comments in the chat. Yes the cell structure. So both of these cells are going to have cell walls and the cell walls are not going to be made out of the same thing that a protist cell wall has or an archaea or a bacteria cell wall has. They're going to be made out of cellulose, a molecule we'll be learning more about in a few weeks. And plants, they're always eukaryotic and they're always multicellular. They always have more than one cell, but they don't always do photosynthesis. They don't? No, they don't always do photosynthesis. We have some plants like this ghost pipe here. It actually grows by pulling nutrients from a fungus. It grows on top of a fungi. No way, that, that is a plant. It's with... a parasitic plant that feeds off of a fungus. And then <laughs> after feeding off for the fungus a while, it forms a flower and makes seeds. And those seeds then will get tra travel through the forest. And if they bump into the right type of fungus, they'll start growing into a new plant. Whoa, it's like the reversed the natural order of things because I would think that usually a fungus would grow feeding off something else and because it can't produce its own energy and you're saying the plant. Yes, in this there side. are parasitic plants. So I was going to say before that to be a plant you had to have chlorophyll and nope. apparently that's not true. To be a plant you have to be multicellular and eukaryotic and your cell walls are going to have a certain structure with cellulose in them, but not all plants do photosynthesis. Most do, like this moss over here, but not all of them. Now, when we get to animals, the variety is even more impressive. This animal right here with all the green tentacles, you might at first think is a plant if you see it in a tide pool because it is green and it doesn't move around very fast, but this is actually an animal. This is a sea anemone and the green color in some animals in the ocean, the green color comes because they have certain algae growing inside them to do photosynthesis, but they are an animal. They're going to capture little bits of drifting food and put it in their mouth and eat it. And they have a stomach that digests food. 
just like you and me, the starfish here are animals and the mussels are animals. And how can you tell if something is an animal? No cell wall. One good way is to look at the cells. And if there is no cell wall, then that's a pretty good clue that what you're looking at is an animal. And will you ever find a single celled animal? Um, no. No. Animals are always multicellular. Always. So that's in the notes from today. That is. And in this next slide, I made a mistake. So real fast, we should not say always multicellular. <gasps> we should say sometimes. Can you write sometimes right there for me, Math Dad? All right. So fungi have a cell wall. They are always eukaryotic. They sometimes can be multicelled and sometimes they can be single celled. And whether you have fungus growing like mold on a orange right here or the classic toadstool or something really bizarre like this octopus flower type mushroom <laughs> where you have white little balls and then the red tentacles burst out, a fungus will always have a cell wall made out of chitin and it will always be a eukaryotic creature. So you said before that plants have cell walls, but it was made of... Cellulose. Okay, cellulose, whereas fungi have cell walls, but it's made of... Chitin, and we're gonna learn more about these molecules next week when we talk about the building blocks of life. But before we can really dive into exactly how cells work, how they get energy, it's important to just take an overview of some of the variety of living things on our planet. And we, before we get to the quiz, I want to ask you guys two quick questions. The first is, what do you think this is? And I'll give you a couple hints. I found this on the bark in my neighbor's yard. It was bright, bright yellow. At first I thought it was a piece of garbage on the ground, but then when I went closer, I could see that there were filaments. And if I zoom in here, you can see all these strands that are interconnected. So did somebody spill cornmeal? And I, Cassie <laughs> suggests moss, Yana says a fungus, Grumpy Monk says moss, and Pascal and Amy suggest lichen. I like these guesses, you guys. Pleochronics says mold. So originally, people thought this was a type of mold, but then the more we studied these type of organisms, the more we realized, hey, they're a little different. These, this is a slime mold, and a slime mold can actually be either single-celled or multi-celled. Mm. It can do both. It can live as a single cell or it can clump all together and make a special thing that will send other cells out and become multi-celled. So they're a really cool organism. We put them in the protist family, but there are some things that don't quite fit. Wait, why is it a protist? I thought mold was fungus. Because the cell walls are not made out of chitin. Mm. So some, you'll see, especially as we're studying DNA more and more, some things are moving around. Things that used to be classified in one group are being moved and classified as something else because once we get looking at the DNA and the genes, then we learn more about it. Now, I wanna give a real quick shout out to some of the excellent cell models that we had come in. So the Gonzalez family and Kylie and Ellie and this fantastic one here, look, they made shrinky dinks which are a little thing you can draw on and then you put it in the oven and they get smaller. These are fabulous. We hope you will have fun making a cell model. And then for today... Oh, they look so good, science mom. Much, so tasty. Much, much better than ours, right? Yeah. <laughs> and for today on page 17, there is a challenge to research some organisms that have been misclassified in the past. So we'll go ahead real fast to page 17 you've got several that you can pick from on this list up here. And one of my favorites I'm going to mention real fast is Calerpa taxifolia. <laughs> this is a seaweed. Is it a plant? So if it was seaweed, no, it was not a plant. It was a protist. Yes, it's a protist. All algae are in the protist family. This type of algae does not have separate cells. It's actually the largest single-celled organism that we know of. It can be up to 30 centimeters tall. That's almost as tall as our puppy Kaladin. <laughs> and all of this is just one cell, little kind of branches that hold onto rocks and these things that look like leaves that branch out. It's all wrapped up in one membrane 
but there are thousands upon thousands of different nuclei, nucleus, that's the plural of nucleus, all throughout the cell and lots of chloroplasts and other organelles as well. All right, so this project then, they're going to have to do some research. They're going to yes. have to try to look things up and see if they can come up with these weird examples. There, I, there's a list here that you can pick from and you can pick any of those on the list and see if you can learn more about some of these things that used to be, we used to think they were one thing and then once we got to know them better we realized, oh man, this is more complex than I thought. Yeah, and let me say also, you don't have to stick to this list. So one thing I can think of is that was misclassified at one point is a dolphin. You used to think that a dolphin, well, it's swimming, it must be a weird type of fish, right? But once we learned how to study them more and look at the characteristics, huh, it doesn't actually match up with a fish. It's not a type no. of fish. It, it's a mammal. It breathes and that doesn't have gills. So th there are definitely other misclassified things that you, you could look up. And now it is time for our What's Under the Microscope mystery, and then we will have polls. All right. So here is what was under the microscope. This one, I have to say, is really hard. So this is a common food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, oh. no hints, science mom. Make mm -hmm. them guess. <laughs> this is a common object, um, and it does kind of have stripes, and it's a little bit yellow. <laughs> Put your guess in the chat. Oh, Yana Art says frozen banana. Pascal says ice, puffball, apple, sugar. Icing. Let's build says ice. Mm. Clarence says bread. Bree says soap. Ibrahim says apple. These are great guesses, you guys. And the answer is it's a banana. That's right. So th this was a banana we cut open. You can see the banana flesh there. Nicely done, and I saw several people who got that right, which I think means that Math Dad is going down in our little friendly competition between Math Dad and the Unbeatable Science Kids when it comes to our polls. All right, so head over to itempool.com slash sciencemom slash live and prepare for a whooping. Our first question has to do with so, whether animals are multicellular. So all animals are multicellular, is that true or false? And sometimes the word animal is not, not used correctly. So this might seem like a super easy question, but it's one I see people get wrong fairly often. And then I see a couple questions that our moderators have gathered for me. Is duckweed microscopic? Good question from Musical Marmoset. I would say it's not microscopic because you can see it with your eyes. It's really small, and the smallest varieties, they are so thin, they're only a few cells thick, but those few cells extend out a long ways, and you get a tiny little raft of green that you can definitely see with your eyes. So when you say a long ways... To, in comparison to cells, oh, the okay. size of cells. Yeah, I, I bet they're a lot more fun to look at under a microscope, but you don't need a microscope to see them. No, the smallest ones are going to be, you know, in between a grain of sand, and um, a small pebble in size. All right, let's reveal our answer here, science mom. And it, this is true. So animals are entirely multicellular. That is right. It, so it is. That was page, page 16 of the notes, kind of, we didn't show it, but it cuts the different kingdoms into single cells versus multi cells, and animals are strictly multicellular. If you have something that's single celled and it's a eukaryotic cell, it's a protist, not an animal. Good job. Next question. All right. Is an individual human nerve cell alive? Yes or no? Hmm. Mm -hmm. This one is an interesting question to think about. Better think fast, though. All right. So I see that Rachel asks, why do animals not have cell walls? This is a good question. And Rachel, I'm not sure if I'm the most qualified person to give an answer. My my initial answer would just be, I don't know. Well, I thought you gave us a pretty good reason last time, though, that plants needed the cell wall so that the cells were strong enough to withstand, to withstand all the, the pressure, and animals don't have that type of pressure That's true. build up. But, but certain types of fungi don't have that type of pressure either. Um, mm. I'm not entirely sure why we do not have cell walls, but we don't need them. Our cells, we, you know, we have structures that protect us like our skin. Um, so we, I, I, the body doesn't want to waste energy making them. All right, we're going to finish and reveal. 
And, okay, chat says yes, and I, I agree with you, although on this one you kind of could try to argue it both ways. Certainly a single human nerve cell couldn't survive on its own outside the body. And I would say that if you looked at those six characteristics of life that we talked about on that very first day, the reproduction one, the genetic information is there, but uh, do the nerve cells actually reproduce? This, I, this I'm, one? I'm not as familiar. Yeah, so this one, you can argue it both ways, but I think most people would agree that the individual cells in your body are alive because in the right conditions, they would still be able to use energy and do the things that living things typically do. But can you take a single nerve cell and from that nerve cell, can you get more human beings? No, not really. <laughs> and can that nerve cell make more nerve cells? Uh, not really. So if you chose no, I'm gonna say you don't need to necessarily count it as wrong. This is a matter of debate and kind of goes back to how defining life is complicated. All right, question three. So true or false, algae is a type of plant. What do you think? And yeah, I see that Yana asks, is the, why is the slime mold yellow? There are lots of different types of slime mold. And I should say, I, I should have qualified when I threw that up. I'm 80% confident that that's a slime mold, but it is possible that I misidentified it because I'm not an expert in slime molds. But I think the yellow color comes from certain pigments that are in the cell wall. I'm not entirely sure. You can get some really fascinating colors in the fungi kingdom. Lots of colors that you wouldn't expect. Yeah, well, that's really cool. All right, finishing up, false. Algae is a protist, not a plant. So good job, you guys. Well done. Nice. E even though algae do have chloroplasts. They do, they do photosynthesis, but they are not plants. All right. True or false, all fungi are multicellular. So if fungus is the singular, mm -hmm. fungi it would it be the plural. plural. Okay, I'm a fungi. You are a fungi, math dad. <laughs> but the, the chat, Unbeatable Science Kids are still gonna squash you so in like, our little contest. So that can be both a compliment and an insult. <laughs> you know, you're such a fun guy. I think we have a winner. Let's go ahead and close the poll because we are getting a little short on time. All right. And false is correct. There are single celled fungi like yeast, and we also have slime molds that can be either single celled or multi celled. Well, those are protists. All Sorry, right. when, I was, when I was a kid, slime molds were in the fungi family, and then they got moved. So, yeah, kind of, kind of strange the way the classifications are, are just not so cut and dry. All right, so select all the multicellular organisms from this list. So that had amoeba, tardigrades, seaweed, baker's yeast, and ferns. So and select any that are multicelled. And do not pick just all of them because if any of the single celled ones get more votes, Math Dad will totally count that as a victory. And then he's very serious about this, you guys. Then he will only play his boahaha and not the silly dance. I'm gonna crush him, science mom. I don't think you are, math dad. As a mathematician, I've gotta say it's interesting. I'm used to answers being either clearly right or clearly wrong. There's usually a, a right or wrong answer to most questions in math. But in biology, so far, so many times we're like, oh, I don't know, you could argue that both ways. Um, it yeah, is, it's just not as cut and dry or as, as black and white. Not at all, not at all. Let's go ahead and finish and reveal. All right. And <gasps> yes, oh. this is absolutely correct. Tardigrades, a lot of time people will think that those are single cell. They are not. They have about a thousand cells. They're tiny little animals. And seaweed is multicellular as well. Not a plant, a protist. Good job. All right. F ferns, those are yeah, plants, Yeah, and right? ferns, of course, plants are multicellular. Okay, so I have to admit defeat here, which means I owe you guys a dance. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done, both Math Dad and Unbeatable Science Kids. We hope that you guys enjoyed learning more about the kingdoms of life and the diversity of life. And be sure to use that little study guide that we made. There is a quiz on pages 18 and 19, I believe, in the notes. So go through and answer those and check yourself and get ready because on Friday, we are going to have our first quiz show. 
and I'm gonna bring the pain, so you better be ready. That's what he thinks, but you guys are gonna dominate and get every question right, I know it. Work hard, grow smart, and we will see you on Friday.